Hi, I'm uh, Akarsh. I'm from Bangalore and uh, I work currently work in uh, LNT Komatsu as uh, an assistant manager in vendor development and purchase. So I'm currently handling around about uh, 10 or 15 projects uh, having different members from uh, cross-functional uh, departments, say uh, maintenance, then production, quality, quality assurance and all that. So, and the projects that I'm currently handling are basically on uh, development projects. Basically, uh, cost reduction or be it alternate sourcing, alternate materials, or maybe new vendor development and things like that. And I have around about uh, eight years work experience in uh, related fields. I started off uh, in quality, uh, quality engineering, quality inspection. And later I moved into the commercial side of vendor development, say purchase and uh, uh, capacity analysis of suppliers and, and all that stuff. So I've uh, been in automobile industry for almost around uh, about six years and have been in L&T for almost around two years now. So it's, it's a varied experience, automobile, then uh, two-wheeler segment, four-wheelers, commercial vehicles and machinery and engineering. This what what it is. So it is good to know about your varied experience. I'm sure you have been involved in machine purchase as well at some time. Yeah. So when you were doing those uh, machine evaluation for purchase, have you been using capability analysis and similar techniques? Yeah, definitely. Uh, see, when I was in uh, quality and vendor development, that's when I was into quality inspection and uh, machine approvals. At that time, we had something called CMCMK in, in our company. So we used to uh, get the we used to go to the machine site, and at the initial stage of approval, we used to take a few samples, do a, a measurement analysis, or say measurement of the uh, parts using the required uh, tools. Then uh, do a CM CMK study. So we, we used to have we used to follow just like uh, that USL minus LSL by six sigma, eight sigma, and all that based on what our requirement would be. And for uh, six sigma, we, we used to have more than 1.3 or 1.6 as a criteria. And for eight, when when it, the denominator was eight sigma, we used to have 1.0 as the criteria for uh, approving the machine. So there, uh, once the machine was approved. So we used to bring it inside and then uh, we used to uh, install it, commission it and do the same trials over and again. So that was done to establish CM after commissioning. Then uh, again uh, after six months or so we used to do the process study, process capability study uh, by involving different operators, different conditions and we used to take subgroups, samples in subgroups, do, do subgrouping uh, logically then. Uh, take samples, then study it, then do the CP study and then say whether the machine is still capable of producing uh, the quality, uh, the parts as per the required quality. That's how we went about. Okay, so uh, for the machine purchase decision, when you did your capability study, uh, what was the method to get samples and how many samples are generally considered okay? Uh, okay, because of uh, raw material constraints, we couldn't have a very big batch. So we had a 25 number batch initially when we went for a vendor uh, visit. <coughs> Sorry, uh, our 25 numbers used to be uh, taken as a, uh, a benchmark for approving the machine. So once it came inside, we used to take uh, subgroups, 20 numbers each, every say every week, 20 numbers, and that used to be subgrouped based on time and operator shift and all that then that used to be taken for CP uh, study. So that's how we went. That the batch size was not, I mean, we could not have a bigger batch size because of manufacturing constraints and raw material availability and all that. Right, so your logical subgrouping for CP, CPK, was it always time-based? Uh, uh, for example, you said so many in a week. Mm -hmm. So the week becomes a subgroup yeah. data. So, or was it uh, done a, with some other uh, grouping methods also? Which one generally made more sense? Uh, time, I did not. Actually, what we went about was uh, we had 20 samples in a week. But also, we used to take those 20 samples in a particular predetermined time, say, first shift with a, an operator A and with a new, new tool insert or something like that. So, we went with that and then we got collected 20 samples before insert change, before the operator change. So then again in the next week we went to the first shift again because you see in manufacturing we have a, a weekly change over shift. So again in the first shift 
we went with uh, the uh, different operator, operator B, and with the same uh, machining conditions. And then the uh, subsequent week, we went to the second shift where the operator would have changed. So we went with operator B again, got 20 samples. And fourth week again, we got operator A in second shift. So though it was uh, the time was fixed as a week, but it was dependent on the operator, the machine condition, say uh, night and day, the temperature of the coolant, and the insert conditions and all that. So it was not basically only the time. It was also the operator and the uh, machine conditions. Right. So being in quality in automotive, you must have been exposed to control charting as well? Yeah, control charts, I should say, we were more uh, on run charts. So once the uh, CM was done and uh, before the CP was to be established, during that period, uh, say six months or so, the, the supervisor of the line used to monitor uh, the critical parameters, so which are very critical to, uh, say, critical to uh, quality of the customer requirement. He used to do a, have a run chart. So he used to monitor five times a shift. And that used to be there continuously. So we had data of how the uh, parameters were moving between the band, uh, to bands, yeah, USL and LSL. Right, so if the run chart shows uh, randomness, shows non-randomness trends, mm -hmm. or shows that data is not random, then uh, what used to be your next step? Yeah, we used to uh, probably, we, we would come to a conclusion that it was fudged. So we had to <laughs> go with a different operator or a different supervisor who, you, who could monitor it properly. So th that is why this uh, taking data and different shifts also helps because the operator changes, the supervisor also changes. So we get proper data because the person in the other shift would not know when we are taking the sampling, when we are doing the study or uh, when we will be taking that uh, data of his to our, for our uh, monitoring. So he didn't know, so he would uh, directly do it without any fudging or without any vested interests. Right. So do you think this data manipulation, kind of uh, manipulation, which happens, is because of consciousness of the operator or any other reasons? Because of fear. Ah. Fear of being caught. Uh, fear, fear that he is not monitoring properly. The inserts are not being changed, coolant is not changed. There's some some uh, problem might happen which he may be caught. Right. But those uh, parameters which are being monitored may not directly affect the customer's requirement immediately. Mm -hmm. It may happen over a period of some uh, 5,000 kilometers or 10,000 kilometers by which time either the people would have forgotten, it's very difficult to trace back exactly what the problem is and all that. So it's just that. So definitely in automotive you must have been using the gauge r and studies as well. So do you have any interesting experience to share on gauge r and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, see, in fact we had uh, uh, the vernier and uh, micrometer, micrometers being uh, done, I mean gauge r and was done. Then uh, it used to be done uh, as like uh, the operator used to do it once, then the supervisor, then the in charge of the shift. Uh, I was in charge of the shift for a few uh, days. So I was asked to do the gauge R&R. And they, they told me, okay, this is the vernier, this is the part. Keep on measuring it. And then, I mean, the thing was, I mean, now I come to know that it should be done in a random way. But at that time, we were doing it continuously. Okay, mm -hmm. you hold the part here, you measure it, and remove it, measure it, remove it. And that may not give the actual result. But we did that. Now I come to know, going back, okay, uh, we should not have done that. Right. So you have been using many of these techniques, although not as a part of Six Sigma project. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the problem solving which is being used in manufacturing very commonly, uh, which also uses these techniques many times, how do you think uh, the Six Sigma approach is going to be different from the problem solving which you normally do? Okay, Six Sigma basically uh, it starts with the project charter and uh, the business case, the urgency of the problem and all that, which we generally don't follow. Whenever there's a uh, problem and it, we see the, uh, we see there is fire in the shop floor, people just run. There's no uh, ordered movement of people, there is no plan and there's no uh, plan to extinguish Then what is the countermeasure taken, how to control it and all that. The DMAIC gives a, a detailed structured way say what is defined, then we have a project charter, a business case, then we go to measure where we have an operational CDQ being defined and then we go to analyze, we have tools and all that. So that way, uh, DMA, IC and Six Sigma, one thing is it makes life simple. We know what to do next and then we know who are involved. 
and what decisions will be taken and everything is is, is so structured and uh, we know what should be the outcome and when it should be done we have target dates being set and it's being monitored using gantt charts and all that so that way i mean going in a, an unstructured way uh, it may, it may take a long time we may have uh, many reasons for failure which we will not be able to attribute to one thing or something but six sigma i mean we have target date set we know responsibilities we know how to analyze it we know tools then we have uh, the toe also uh, which which helps us a lot so that way people will know people will uh, be easily uh, be able to understand what to do next which tools to use and what results we'll get so so right. <clears throat> right so if people generally have tendencies to jump into the issue and try to solve the problem or reach some uh, quick decisions mm mm-hmm. Uh, and if you have to think about culture change in the company where uh, a well thought out systematic approach should be followed so that a sustainable solution is found and it will be sustained over a long period mm-hmm. and the repeated fire fighting issues will be less less frequent uh, what do you think are the key drivers for this kind of approach to be implemented in any company uh, first of all six sigma may not be known to everyone it's it's quite often in many companies we don't see everyone knowing six sigma and then at least the tools and all that we may be using it so first thing is at least to educate people what it is about and how we are going to attack the problem so that way people at least in the first stage they'll know what it is and how it makes their life simple and how they'll not be questioned or blamed or anything for this because it's data driven so there's no one to be blamed so uh, that that is one thing the first stage is educating them i mean the second stage is telling them yeah the benefits that they get say someone may be promoted because of the project being successful so we don't know it it will definitely happen uh, in one project or the next so and moreover it is data driven uh, so that that is the first stage second stage is uh, telling them of uh, the the benefits that they get the third thing okay uh, we'll have to uh, bring them to the top management level where the top management will try to force the six sigma techniques on them and finally yes we may have to go with course and so that that's generally not uh, okay. done anywhere but okay that's that that's the last resort i think uh, you have shared some very interesting experiences from your manufacturing background uh, do you have any message for people who are seeing this video mm, yeah i definitely recommend uh, engineers or anyone who's working in who is working to uh, go to uh, do green belt or black belt so that it will be very helpful for them to work it will make their life simple it will make their uh, peers life simple it will be very easy to achieve success and uh, from the trainings that i have got i definitely recommend uh, benchmark it's really good in fact i was recommended to go to benchmark from one of my own uh, relatives who's who's in a who's uh, having a who's in a very senior position in a, a similar field so i definitely recommend all people to do at least a green belt if not black belt at least green belt and then obviously you will come to know whether you have to do black belt or not it's it's very much required very much required so i am very uh, uh, happy with that i'm i'm very benefited with that see in fact uh, because i'm in projects uh, the project charter the business case and all that i learned a lot about it in uh, green belt and now i'm uh, applying that in all my projects it's really good thank you and and uh, it's good that you joined us in this discussion thanks a lot thank you for inviting